Well, welcome everyone to the Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. And this evening, we're very delighted to have with us a panel of experts on COVID. And their talk is entitled Then, Now, and Tomorrow. COVID, Then, Now, and Tomorrow. And I guess I should say COVID-19. Uh, we've uh, been working with this virus ever since it was discovered at the Urban League, trying to make people aware of the impact, trying to track down, working with the now the Population Health Consortium to help find access to testing and vaccine. And um, this meeting is really designed to bring us all up to date on what's happening, what the effects were, what we learned, and what to expect in the future. And I'm pleased to have with us tonight um, several of our interns from the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice who work in the area of public health. Uh, Sadia Barge, their coordinator, is here with us tonight. And we have a special guest, Anna Alvarez, uh, who works directly in the field. And I'll let, uh, I'll turn it over to Ume Sanzita, our lead intern on this project to help put it together and uh, have her begin the introductions. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, like Dennis mentions, uh, today's town hall meeting is going to be about the public health issues surrounding COVID-19. So Jacksonville's initial response, the current response, and future expectations from so, um, from uh, the information that we are learning. So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Ume Sanzita. Um, I'm currently in my last semester at Seminole State College and will be starting at the University of South Florida um, to do my uh, master's in health informatics and data analytics. And hi everyone, my name is Maya Arrington. I'm currently a master's of public health student at George Washington University. I'm also in my last year. Hi, I'm Shobham. I'm a freshman at UT and studying economics, and I'm glad to be here. Good evening. My name is Red, and I am also finishing out my master's in public health at Georgia Southern University. Hi, everyone. My name is Ainsley Parkerson, and I'm a current sophomore at the University of Virginia majoring in history. So uh, let me introduce our guest speaker tonight. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Anna Alvarez, Associate Professor in Pediatric Infectious Disease and Immunology with the University of Florida College of Medicine of Jacksonville. She was appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to the Advisory Council for the Elimination of Tuberculosis, and she was also the Director of Education and Community Engagement of the UF Centers for HIV, AIDS, Research, Education, and Services. Okay, and so to begin, I wanted to give a recap of COVID-19, starting out with the emergence. So uh, COVID-19 was caused by the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and it was first identified in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China. And from there, it spread globally, leading to widespread of infections that we've seen. Um, and so there has been multiple variants that consistently mutated over the course of the pandemic. Um, you guys might be familiar with Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Om Omicron. And there's also been the creation of vaccines. So there are two types of vaccines. Um, there are the mRNA vaccine, and then there is the protein subunit vaccines. So an example of mRNA is the Pfizer-BioNTech, and then there's also Moderna. And we also have the protein vaccines, which are Novavax. And from there, we have seen public health measures that have been put into place to help combat the coronavirus. We've seen lockdowns, social distancing, there's mask mandates, and also travel restrictions. And now looking at the impact. So COVID-19 has had a profound effects on not just people's health, but also on the economy, healthcare system, 
mental health and social dynamics. It also has disproportionately affected vulnerable populations and exacerbated um, already existing inequalities. And so now the challenge that we are seeing today is despite progress in vaccination and treatment, um, there's challenges remaining with the vaccine distribution inequities. There's a high rate of vaccine hesitancy. Um, and then, of course, the emergence of new variants and ongoing infections. And I'm going to pass it on to my fellow intern to continue the conversation. Oh, it looks like we lost Shabam. I think he disconnected. I just let him back in. Here he is. Okay. Sorry Thanks. for that. I got kicked out. All good. Okay. So I'll now I'll be talking about public health in Florida and Duval County. So as a primarily Republican state, Florida's policymaking has leaned conservative on many public health issues. Governor Ron DeSantis and the state legislature, for instance, in March of 2023, enacted legislation for a medical freedom state that prioritized state freedoms over federal health mandates and allowed doctors to turn patients away based on personal beliefs. Notably, a few months prior, on January 17, 2023, one of DeSantis' policy proposals protected doctors from losing their medical licenses whenever they voiced professional opinions. In addition, the legislation empowered Floridians, for Floridians to opt out of forced COVID-19 testing, masking, and va vaccinations, as well as other World Health Organization guidelines. And this action goes to show how the state legislature and Ron DeSantis, you know, wants to propel the state and, you know, aspire to be a more proactively independent state in regards to healthcare. Such a jarring conservative mindset was apparent during the pandemic and inevitably trickle down to Florida cities and counties. And Duval County in particular reflected these po uh, political decisions through many unsavory trends. For one, around 95% of hospitalized patients in 2021 were unvaccinated, with countless more spilling into hospitals and straining ward capacities. Further, in September of 2021, as you can see by the graph next to the text, COVID cases surged from the low 100s in October to over a 2,000 case daily average at the year's turn. Alongside this, test positivity rates spiked from 2.7% in October of 2021 to 36.6% in January 2022. Average hospitalizations rose from 72 to 667 in October to November, and deaths per day elevated from 0 0.75 in January 2022 to over 8 in March. And these trends really worsened the already unvaccinated vulnerability in 2021, where two more spikes over, of over 100 daily case average occurred and where average hospitalizations reached an all-time high of 1,354 between August 6th and 12th. And I think when, when you take that data into account, it really goes to show how Florida, you know, uh, actions towards COVID-19 really showed how they desired to be a more independent state. Um, and as you go to the, if you go to the next slide, um, there are two quotes by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Goldhagen. Um, they're from an interview I had with him recently, and they basically, to some extent, sum up the 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 situation in Florida and Duval County. So, in his first quote, he basically says, and I'll summarize: We rely we rely on a public health system, or Florida relies on a public health system that has not only been dismantled, but even worse, has pursued non evidence based din disinformation conspiracy theories and has impacted people who otherwise oh, would yeah, be Medicaid yes. in an expanded it's Medicaid it's environment. Down. And then as for a second quote, um, doc the doctor mentioned that um, Florida has a surgeon general named Joseph Latipau, who is against all things vaccination, all mRNA vaccines and so forth. Because when Ron DeSantis appointed um, Joseph Latipau in 2021, you could see um, uh, based on the data I mentioned earlier that when he appointed him, that's when this, the, the, the graph really spiked up. Um, and he, the doctor also went, goes on to mention that when um, Florida received $150 million worth of federal dollars um, in Florida, you know, the Surgeon General just sat on it, you know, which goes to signify 
at least to some extent, the state legislatures um, and Florida's uh, reluctance to, um, you know, push, um, do um, be involved with the federal government when it comes to COVID. Thank you so much, Shovam. Um, next, we're going to hand it over to Anna, so that way she can elaborate on some common symptoms and some other um, types of medical diagnoses we, we associate with COVID-19. Yes, thank you. Um, so these are the, the common symptoms that most people recognize, um, and uh, it's not only associated with COVID, with, with other viruses too, other respiratory viruses, but basically, the, the highlight was the fever, usually it was a very, very high fever. Um, and then followed by cough, that could be quite severe. Um, shortness of breath also, that could range from mild to severe. And then uh, fatigue um, and debilitating symptoms. Um, so we, we clinically distinguish, kind of classify COVID into acute COVID and then post COVID. Um, uh, conditions. Um, and then acute COVID, we also subclassify that into mild and severe COVID. And <clears throat> I just want to highlight that 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 is the whole reason why uh, everybody was uh, uh, terrified of this virus, because there were uh, initially, when the population was completely non-immune to it, uh, this virus attacked a lot of people, especially people with underlying conditions, the elderly, people with hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and, and they were um, just succumbing to the virus. Many of them were in ICU and many of them were intubated and didn't make it. A lot, it was a, a high mortality um, issue with, with severe COVID. The severe COVID is not only, a, a, the virus not only attacks the lungs, but also attacks the heart and other organs like the kidneys, the brain. Um, so it's, it, it becomes pretty systemic and, and uh, fatal for, for the, that initial wave where we found, found a population that was completely non-immune and, and defenseless. So, um, after a few uh, months of when we started seeing COVID in 2020, we started noticing admissions and here in Jacksonville, uh, in the Children's Hospital of kids that presented with a very rare condition that we were not sure what it was. It, it reminded us a little bit of like a disease that we know for as Kawasaki disease or toxic shock syndrome, but it wasn't like, completely fitting that criteria and we were wondering what it was and just uh, as we were starting to see more and more cases then um, the first descriptions of the syndrome um, came from um, um, UK and, and Europe, Italy um, and they um, describe these, these syndrome where they have affection of multi-organ systems and they were in shock and they were uh, requiring I see intensive care measures. So many, many of them required intubation, mechanical ventilation. Some kids went into renal kidney failure and required dialysis. Um, and this this is what is it was later called MISC, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And it's, it was uh, caused by by COVID, but it was caused by the immune uh, reaction to COVID. So we used to see this this syndrome for about four to six weeks after the acute infection of the kids. Um, and they were ex extremely, extremely sick. Many of them um, just admitted for, in the hospital for several days to weeks. Um, so that was that was horrible. And then we started noticing um, that some of the, the adults mostly, and then, and then we started noticing also in kids after they recovered from acute COVID, they continue to have these conditions that were um, not not getting better, and that includes, you know, extreme fatigue, uh, something that people call call brain fog. Basically, they were not they they lost their capacity to concentrate and focus on certain things that disrupted their the way they're thinking, the way they could work. For students, it, it just many of them could not go back to school because we not concentrate and focus on 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 school. 
um, heart problems, palpitations. Um, so that that is all what we, uh, 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 the 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 combination of all of those or some of those is what we call long COVID now, and it's a real thing. It's it, it's one of those things that we we have not really have it clear exactly how it happens, but it's real. So people think that people just make it up, but it's not, and it's very debilitating. Um, this this is becomes a chronic condition, not and and for many of these patients, it lasts for even for months and even more than a year, um, and they're t totally devastated in regards to like they know they can't work, they can go back to school, all of that. So this this is a virus that has the capacity of really affecting the human system in many many different ways, and um, and really um, produce severe severe presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the access and equity surrounding uh, COVID nineteen. So we're going to turn that over to our interns in charge of the section. Yes, so I will briefly talk about access and equity in regards to COVID-19 in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Jacksonville has a diverse healthcare infrastructure, um, including hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare facilities that serve the local populations. Um, of course, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic had accelerated the adoption of telehealth and virtual care services. Uh, which, which of course minimized the uh, transmission of the virus, but also hindered access to healthcare services for certain individuals, um, such as low income individuals, um, people with uh, populations like with a lack of access to uh, technology or internet connection, or the elderly who are not like technology savvy. Um, and also access to COVID-19 vaccines, testing and screenings have been the critical component for, uh, for to uh, address the COVID-19 pandemic in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, in a report that was uh, in 2021, I believe, in Jacksonville, it stated in Jacksonville, 8% of white residents 12% of Black residents, 18% of residents of other races, and 10% of Hispanic residents have been infected with COVID-19. And that was um, sourced from the CDC website. Um, and an another interesting point that I found was that uh, the, Amer the African-American make up 30% of the population of uh, Duval County but 40% of the American, the African American population was hospitalized for COVID-19. Um, also the Department of Health of um, Duval County uh, implemented the, the COVID-19 Health Equity Project, which, uh, which identify, uh, which uh, implement, which uh, addressed uh, the COVID-19, sorry, which addressed the COVID-19 health equity disparities and advanced, which addressed the COVID-19 disparities and advanced health equity, sorry. And then we can go on to the next slide. And then we can, uh, talk about some of the, ex the access and equity strategies that was used and are still being used um, currently till this day. Uh, the, of course, the expansion of existing and uh, the development of new prevention resources and services, uh, which I believe in, Jackson in Jacksonville, especially, but throughout the United States, the vaccination mobile units and the uh, uh, vaccination centers, the drive, the drive-through testing sites, and and the COVID nineteen uh, task force 
was implemented to mitigate COVID-19. And then also the co comprehensive approach that addresses the underlying social de determinants of health and in increasing increase access to healthcare services and prioritize the needs of the vulnerable community communities. Um, and some of, some examples were uh, the emergency rental utility assistance program and Another example was the mortgage referral program, I believe. And that uh, that was helpful to the, the local populations. And uh, the collaboration between healthcare providers, community organizations, policymakers, and advocacy groups, and faith-based groups as well um, was uh, also helpful. The, uh, the vaccine, the, the, with uh, many strategies and efforts, the vaccination rate uh, went from 45% in 2021 to 65% in 2022 in Duval County, Jacksonville, um, which, which took a lot of measures such as education, door-to-door -door outreach, uh, the certain um, many measures of recovery uh, resources that was provided to uh, mitigate uh, the transmission of the virus. And then uh, many uh, education programs and uh, other, other uh, outreach programs and were implemented. One that I was uh, very enlightened, enlightened about was the Wellness on Wheels, uh, which was implemented in Jacksonville, where the Jacksonville Transportation Authority partnered with uh, the Agape Health, where they uh, retro retrofitted two buses into the mobile COVID-19 vaccine clinics. And so, uh, and, and so they went to like, uh, they used the, the, those two buses to go to like senior senior facilities, uh, churches, um, and like rural locations where people are don't don't have like um, access to uh, the, the vaccines or testing sites, and so that was one very um, helpful. And then we can go to the, and then also, so the vac vac vaccinations of COVID-19 brought uh, a lot of anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. So uh, the spread of that uh, caused a lot of mistrust of public health institutions, healthcare providers and gov government authorities. Uh, so the vaccine hesitancy conspiracy theories and misinformation caused a disruption of public health efforts uh, uh, and of course a reduction of overall vaccination uptake and there were there were um, several research and study that showed that vaccinations and and uh, the vaccination intentions were significantly lower um, due to the anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. Thank you so much, Red. That was some great information. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it back over to Anna. Uh, we're going to discuss the new CDC guidelines that have been um, published for how to ha handle COVID-19. Thank you. Um, I want to say before we even go into the, into the guidelines that uh, because of the um, tremendous effort of, of um, introducing new vaccines for COVID in a very, very rapid fashion, more historically, um, a vaccine takes for development uh, 10 years, 12 years, and, and, and the development of these vaccines took less like about a year or so. Of course, it was there were some underlying studies before that, but just the the availability of this vaccine 
for people that were suffering was amazing. And it's just really a, a something that we have to recognize with the with the public health system in the United States. Um, and with in spite of all the conspiracies and 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 the mistrust. Um, if it wasn't for the vaccine, the numbers would be looking so much different. So the, the vaccines really made a difference in regards to mortality in the middle of the of the pandemics with the uh, um, with the variants that were more virulent than others. Um, the vaccine also uh, protects kids for MISC. So uh, the the kids that that have been vaccinated um, don't don't get that. And also there's some data to show that the vaccines also protect for long COVID for the, so, so definitely made, made a big difference. And this brings us to the new CDC guidelines. Um, this, is, this is really a product of many, uh, several years of looking at the trends, uh, looking at the variants, looking at how people reacted to, the, to every variant whenever they came. And, um, because now most of the population is immune to COVID, at least to one of the variants. Um, there's some cross reactivity between antibodies against the different uh, variants. Um, a lot of people are protected, not against infection. So people can get infected. You hear a lot of people having COVID now as a, just a cold, like a, they can have just literally like a sore throat, a little bit of fever. Um, but that is because of that immunity. So, so between the people that got COVID itself infection and the people that got vaccinated, the immunity in the United States is probably in the 80 something percent. Um, and that makes a big difference in regards to the mortality and morbidity of this when, when you get COVID. Yeah, we don't see the hospitals running around with hundreds of, of people with COVID in the hospital, which is what we saw with the first the first wave, um, it's less hospitalizations, the, the mortality has decreased also quite a bit. And because of that, it's um, now not as um, dangerous on, or, or terrifying as it, as it used to be. And, and given credit to the CDC, they have had to adjust their guidelines many times. And people have criticized the CDC a lot for changing guidelines. But they were literally adapting the guidelines according to what they were seeing at the moment. They didn't have a, a crystal ball to see the future and, and is a new virus. And we, we really didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. So the, the uh, criticism for the CDC are unwarranted, really. They, they did the best they could and, and they have been studying and adjusting the guidelines according to what is happening. Because they haven't been like strict on, on what needs to be done. So now with the, with the, with that with that uh, statistics of, of less hospitalizations, less death, they uh, came up with the, with new guidelines for um, for um, the management isolation for for mm -hmm. COVID, for testing, for isolation, and for um, using masks. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide. So this is really this slide is really a summary of the of the guidelines. I mean the, the, the guidelines themselves it was longer to read, but the basic uh, three questions really that that the guidelines respond to is uh, when can I when can people go back to work? Uh, when do people need to be tested? And when do they need to use masks? in general. Um, so, so now with, with that change in the epidemiology of, of, um, of COVID-19, um, the CDC uh, decided to put it together, the, the guidelines for prevention, put together these, these guidelines that are not just for COVID, but you see it's for, it's a respiratory virus guideline. So that includes three viruses, COVID-19, influenza flu, and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, which also causes every year an epidemic in, in, in everywhere in the United States. Um, so the they put the three viruses in, the, in this category of respiratory virus guidelines. This is not just for COVID, it covers the three, those three viruses. And this also doesn't apply to healthcare facilities. This is for 
the public in general. Um, so basically, the, the, they emphasize as usually the the the, the main things that we we'll do get get uh, immunizations or vaccines whenever they're available. So we have immunizations available for flu. We have immunizations vaccines available for COVID. There is actually a vaccine also for RSV, very new and and limited to a certain population, but definitely um, trying to protect the more vulnerable. Uh, so now we have immunizations uh, for the three of them. Um, so the important thing is try to promote the vaccination, make the use of the, of the vaccines that we have that protect people against severe disease. Um, the other part of it is the part of the core prevention is obviously hygiene, especially hand, hands, uh, hygiene, you know, washing hands, soap, hand sanitizer, all of that. Steps for cleaner air, um, there's a lot of, uh, of explanations of how uh, we can maybe, um, we know that the vir these viruses stay in the environment, in, in, uh, in the air, and then obviously we get more chances of acquiring the virus the longer we stay in a close place where other, where other people actually have the infection. So there are some measures that people can take in their house, like opening the, the, the windows, opening the doors whenever it's possible and safe, using maybe some portable um, filters for cleaning the air, um, using the fans in the ceiling fans, move move those with especially with doors open, kind of try to get that the air to circulate. Uh, some people use even like the ventilator that they use for the bathroom and the kitchen, and those things also absorb that and clear the air a little bit. So that's part of that. They talk about that a lot. There's treatment, um, and now we have treatment for two of the three viruses. There's no treatment for RSV, but when we have effective treatment for COVID. And we have effective treatment for flu, so obviously that is uh, that's uh, that's great and uh, helps control um, not only the disease but also the transmission of the virus to other people. And then stay home when you're sick uh, to prevent the spread. So then um, the question then is how long do we need to stay home when somebody is sick? So this, this new guideline, they, they, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't require that, it, that to prove that it is COVID. It's like if you have respiratory symptoms and fever, then what they're recommending is that people stay at home for uh, 24 hours um, and um, after the, uh, the, the fever is better. So basically they don't have any fever without taking any medication. So if you have to take Tylenol for fever, then and you're not having fever, it doesn't count if you have to take Tylenol. So basically it's without any medication, fever for 24 hours and the symptoms, the reverse petrol symptoms, the cough and the and the runny nose and all of that are getting better. It doesn't have to be completely gone, but this, the, this, the, the trend that it's better, the fever is gone for 24 hours. Then they can go, people can go back to work but for the following days, they need to take addition precautions, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so that's for, for the following five days after they go back to work. So the additional things would be the mask. Um, and that is it's recommended, not doesn't have to be an N95 mask, it just could be like surgical mask, but they should wear it at, at work. Um, trying to keep um, distancing as much as possible in the office and in the workplace, and then the testing. Uh, so in regards to the question about who to test, the recommendation is not to test everybody. I know everybody wants to know if they have it or not have it, and they can do that, especially with the home kids now. But really the recommendation is to test the people that are more vulnerable, that are more likely to have more severe disease. That means the elderly, the very young, and the people with immunocompromising conditions, and also including like heart conditions, hypertension, diabetes, or the people with predisposing conditions should be tested when they have a respiratory illness with fever, because it's good to know if they have it because they can be treated, mostly because the treatment is so effective that if, if they don't know they have it, they won't they won't require, they, they won't get the treatment. And so it's important to know that they have it uh, to be treated. Uh, for people that do not have um, um, in, in a compromising condition, um, 
usually they don't require treatment. So it doesn't matter if you have it or don't have it. It's good to know. And another, another reason to test is also to test to protect like people surrounding healthy people. So for example, if I'm healthy, but I'm going to visit my mother and my mother is older, I want to, and I have a respiratory symptom, like a respiratory infection, I want to know if it's COVID or not. And now, nowadays we cannot tell by, by clinical presentation if it's COVID or not, because it could look like flu and COVID and everything can look the same. So um, it's important to to actually know if, which one I have if I'm sick uh, before I go visit my grandparents or my parents or anybody that is immunocompromised and stuff. So that would be a good reason to, to test. It is not recommended to test for, for returning to school or returning to work or it, it doesn't matter because the testing is not that reliable. It can test positive depending on the testing. Some of those tests can be positive for a long time. And some of the other tests, especially the rapid tests, the one and the ones that you do at home are not that accurate. So it could, it's a false, a lot of false positives and false negatives. So it, it's not re really recommended to test for, for that, like a test of cure. No, that, that's not recommended anymore. And then again, the use of, of masks is usually if you've had a respiratory infection for the following five days after resolve the resolution of the fever, then it is recommended to use masks. And then if obviously um, you're gonna be in contact with somebody that is immunocompromised that is at high risk of developing severe disease, then obviously it's recommended to use the, uh, the mask, but not like for everybody. This, as I said, doesn't apply for the hospital settings, the healthcare facilities. The healthcare facilities have a whole, that, that those guidelines haven't changed. Uh, recently, so there's still over there is it's isolation and use of gowns and masks and all of that. But but these these guidelines, these new guidelines are for the public in general, not just not for the hospital, basically. Um, I think that's it for this slide. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. So um, for some more information that's available to the public, and that can be very useful for the individuals in Jacksonville, uh, Florida Health offers information about COVID-19 testing, lost COVID cards, adult religious exemptions, and COVID-19 in Florida. Jack's Ready offers up-to-date City of Jacksonville Preparedness Guide and Resources. And of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention gives recommendations about COVID-19 related protocol and assistance on ways to help protect the most at risk. Here is any of the uh, resources that we use as part of the research done for this presentation. So if you would like to look further more into it, uh, the uh, citations are here. And next we have some questions for our guest speaker, Anna. So um, first question for me, uh, what are the changes that healthcare facilities have to undergo to be able to adapt to dealing with COVID-19 cases? Um, well, as I said, the, they really haven't changed the, uh, the, the, the current guidelines, but the current guidelines is basically isolation in special rooms with maybe pressure. Um, and then um, the personnel, the health personnel has to um, uh, wear gown and masks, um, but not, we don't, we wear N95 masks, not, not just a regular surgical mask to go, still to go into rooms with patients with, with, uh, COVID. Um, because the numbers have decreased, there is not, uh, right now, there's not such a rush. Um, we did have in the Children's Hospital um, a very high acuity and basically a, a, a waiting list in the ER um, for admissions because coincide the um, COVID with flu and RSV all increase at the same time. So the hospital is just like packed. And for all of them, we need isolation. Um, not, a little bit stricter for COVID than for the other ones, but it, it just um, um, really affected the, uh, a lot of the healthcare professionals got sick too. So a lot of like sick illness, sick, sick um, 
not only patients, but sick doctors and nurses and care caregivers. Um, so, you know, a lot of extra turn, extra time to be on call and, and those kind of things. Um, so it requires from the hospital standpoint, the ability to be flexible and, and be able to accommodate changing shifts and, and things like that. It's very costly and obviously, um, um, draining physically and emotionally when when the hospital gets full of people with respiratory illnesses so that's where the vaccines would help <laughs> a lot i agree um next question can you discuss the mental health impacts of the pandemic on jacksonville residents and what support services are available to address those issues um, yes, I mean that is the whole a whole topic. If you, you could spend another hour just talking about that, because it really um, affected um, a lot the mental health of the of population for the people that got COVID uh, and for the families because of the amount of stress, hospitalization, the the loss of so many lives. Um, for the people that actually got COVID and survive, um, it, it's, um, it, it has, um, especially for persons that were already suffering some kind of mental illness, anxiety, for example, or some sort of depression, kind of push them over the edge, completely decompensated, and um, uh, required many times even admissions to the psychiatric units because they were so, so out of control. And then obviously after the um, control in the hospital, the, the biggest challenge was to find outpatient uh, therapy and doctors that would take care of them um, because of the massive amount of people that needed that. We just, we just realized that it was a huge shortage of mental health providers in, in Jacksonville. Um, you have no idea how many times people got discharged with like follow up with a psychiatrist in two, three days. And there's like no psychiatrist to follow up with. Um, uh, it, it, it just opened, opened our eyes to the, to, the, um, to the efficiencies on that part of the system. Um, it's, it's not really that, that, that easy to find a quick, I mean, you can imagine all of the healthcare providers were also full, like they had so many patients. And so uh, many, many, many of those providers were not even taking new patients. Um, it, was, it was very chaotic. It's very chaotic and, and really devastating. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, still, we're still dealing with that, unfortunately, because many of those patients that developed those just haven't like gone back to normal or gone back to their baseline. So it's still it's still an issue and still an area that that needs to be addressed to facilitate more uh, you know access to mental health providers. I completely agree. Um, even working in the ER, unfortunately, um, working with minors, a lot of these kids have to end up coming to us because these mental health facilities just don't have room for them. So I, I completely agree. It's, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, yes. Finally, uh, what strategies are being employed to address vaccine hesitancy and ensure equitable, equitable distribution of vaccines across the neighborhoods in Jacksonville? Um, yeah, that is, that's a, a really good question. I mean, the, the main thing is to recognize what the initial, to recognize what the barriers are um I think that um so the main thing we we should do is try to understand why people are not getting the vaccines if if it is because of um accessibility or if it's because of hesitancy or and then why um and and then um I think to to really um in my experience it's a lot of um um distrust to the government and even to the doctors. It's very heart, heartbreaking for me as a doctor to have a patient that I've known for years to tell me that now that he doesn't trust me anymore uh, because now they think that all the medicine is completely like 
uh, against them and uh, we want to manipulate people and things like that it's it's it's, it's really bad i think that um to solve the the main the, the issue of that is it's going to require a lot of work but we have to be optimistic i think it requires definitely collaboration with um with the community because um there's no better messenger than somebody that comes from the same community i think that the the um, um, faith-based organizations also ha can play a, a big, big role because uh, people still um, uh, trust their 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 religious leaders, and if we can uh, get get them engaged, the the, the religious leaders uh, and also like the leaders of the community, uh, I think that um, um, we can at least start changing the that that. Uh, that line, that plot, um, a lot of education, really. I think, I think other things that people have done is like have like some champion in the community that if if they are convinced that the vaccine is are, is good, we can enroll them and then they can they can be a, an element of change in, in the community. It's very hard for somebody that is not part of the community to come and tell them what to do, right? So we need to really work with the communities and and try to use the, their their influence in in the neighborhoods and stuff like that more than anything. I mean, I can we can try to educate and do flyers and do podcasts and those kind of things which is it's fine but if the podcast is not coming from somebody that they trust they're not even, they're not going to even listen to it so um that that is a challenge i think i think there's a lot of uh, misinformation in the in the media and so that is really hard to control because it's not um regulated and um and that would be a good step towards improving the like in the right information is try to regulate what's out there but obviously not <laughs> sorry it's easier said than done <laughs> but i think yeah i think that we should not uh, you know be pessimistic we, we need to just think that we can make some changes uh, but it, it will require a lot of work and a lot of time uh, to make changes Thank you so much. You you made some great points about just collaborating, educating, and just advocacy in general um, on trying to spread the word. Uh, we do have a little bit of time left. So if any of our participants have any questions for Anna, you are more than happy to ask. Oh, yeah, I just have something to add to what. So I liked how doctor you said that, you know, there's this distrust among doctors. And I think that can be kind of fostered towards, you know, you know, the reason could be that, you know, I mentioned uh, Ron, um, Governor DeSantis, his aim to, um, you know, uh, you know, for a medical freedom state. And part of the legislation was, you know, allowing doctors to, you know, speak freely on, on social issues and, you know, weed out patients and turn them away. And, you know, if doctors could weed, you know, patients out based on abortion, sex or racial convictions, you know, simply due to the fact they resent their patients, you know, they could become little political arbiters and instigators in uh, in the healthcare system. And you know how, and you know, they could, you know, sort of become the politicians of medicine. And, uh, you know, and we all know how people's attitudes towards politicians are, right? They're, they they tend to be distrustful. They don't believe them. And I think um, what you said before, you know, your longtime patients not recognizing, I mean, not coming towards, going to you can be, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but like I just found a correlation that, you know, doctors, you know, becoming these instigators and arbiters in, in, in the healthcare system could breed, you know, mistrust among between patients and doctors and, and violate the, the doctor patient agreement. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, it goes both ways. <laughs> <laughs> it goes both ways. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, uh, Dr. Alvarez. How much has the um, medical community learned through this process? What are some of the important learnings as a result of COVID-19? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> um, 
Well, one one thing that I think we we have to uh, recognize is uh, uh, to be humble. Just recognize that there are a lot of things that we don't know, uh, and and um, and I think that's important. It was a, a big blow for <laughs> our system at the beginning, and I, we thought that we were prepared, but we were not. <laughs> And so it taught us a lot, a, a lot of lessons in regards to that. And then, um, you know, recognizing things earlier and, and act quickly, um, it, it's, it's also, you know, very, very important. You know, the, just the organization of the system. I think the, the whole medicine in the United States have learned a, a big lesson with, uh, with, with COVID. Um, and, and one thing that personally I I always um, uh, I say regret, but it's not regret because it's not my fault. But I just feel just very sad that it happened. Is the politicization of medicine? Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was the worst thing that could happen for for example for a vaccine for the vaccine. As soon as they politicized the vaccine then we knew that it was going to be a bad thing. Medicine can be politicized. Like we, we should not let that happen. Um, and and it, it, it happened with COVID and then now it's like very, very hard to, to, to go back. Um, the whole using a mask was politicized, which had nothing to do with politics. But, you know, you know, the, those days in, in, in early days, if you were wearing a mask in the supermarket, oh, you were here. If you're not wearing a mask, oh, then you're my people and that kind of thing. It's it, it's terrible. So like to try to stay uh, neutral to politics. I mean, you can have your own politics personally, but in, professionally, I think we need to really fight against that because that only hurts the people. You know, the, nobody more than the people when when things medicine gets politicized. Yeah, politics tends to make things as like trivial as wearing a mask. You know, you know, and make people want to not listen to them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the whole the whole multidisciplinary approach to things um, was also a big part of it. You know, the the whole collaboration between um, the research people with the public health people, um, that was great. I think that those were big lessons, but actually I think that worked really well, especially uh, that first year. Yeah, well, I, I recommend you read the book, um, Political Determinants of Health by Daniel Dawes. Um, and he was thinking about this long before COVID. <laughs> uh, when you when you read about what's really been happening in the uh, political space and in terms of uh, medicine, it's really no no different than any other industry. Uh, there are people that are making money, and they're influencing the political uh, process to assist them in running their business. Um, now, having said that, I just attended a, a lecture, an online lecture about um, the uh, common ground among business, uh, government, and um, non-governmental organizations. And by given by one of the most famous uh, business advisors, uh, Michael Porter from the from Harvard Business School. And he was pointing out that we all have the same thing in mind um, to do what we think is right for our organization. It, he said, and when, when we work together to do the right thing, we can do a lot of good. It's, it's only when people try to overcome the system through, you know, their, their own uh, uh, success rather than thinking of the common good that things, that a problem comes along. Yes, absolutely. And the other thing I learned a lot too was that the, uh, um, 
World Health Organization was working on on this a long time ago in terms of um, truly creating a um, healthcare system that tried to be equitable for everyone. And, and it, it frankly, uh, it never really came about in this country. You know, we, we don't have a public health system. The only public health system we got was because we had a uh, uh, post reconstruction or post civil war. Um, there was concern about uh, freedmen and their lack of access to health care. So they actually empowered the freedmen bureaus to provide health for free. But once those were disbanded, we didn't have anything in place and really haven't. Uh, you know, it's all generally speaking privately run, even though it's paid for through Medicaid and Medicare and things like that. So it's interesting. And very interesting, yes. Well, yeah, I also have one last question. Um uh, if if it's if like applicable, like uh like after the like for during the aftermath of COVID, how have organizations like the hospitals or um you work and you know uh tried to increase proactiveness regarding safety health measures? Um, I can I can kind of tell you about uh, what Baptist I, I work at I mean I work for University of Florida so work oh University at the whole oh, yeah yeah my bad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's different things, but um, yeah, but yeah. I work for the I, I also work for the Children's Hospital, which is part of Baptist, mm. and and they're um yeah no they they were especially um when when we when we have these these epidemics occurring like simultaneously and uh, and and the hospital is just way I mean it's been this year was was really really bad. Um, they kind of like all of a sudden realize or, or get reminded, they know this, but they get reminded that the the, the work is, is, is before that. Like mm -hmm. if we're in the middle of the pandemic, yeah. Like, um, so the the work of like vac the vaccine campaigns, for example, for mm -hmm. flu, this this year flu was just really bad. Most of the worst cases was flu more than COVID. Um, and that's preventable, but the vaccination. Mm -hmm rate in Jacksonville is low for flu it's really low yeah. um, so so that that's kind of what they're they're saying I, I, I went to one of the meetings they were talking about what they can do uh to help the pediatricians well, obviously this is a children's hospital so mm -hmm. that's where the meeting that I go to but they're talking about like how they can support the pediatricians in implementation and 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 um you know motivation and and encouraging people to get vaccinated yeah uh, and then put some money into that because it's at the end an investment for them too because when the hospital is full this is just really a bad situation for everybody yeah. Yeah. i agree i agree thank oh, you yeah. yes thank you and one last you. question oh go ahead <laughs> so uh in in florida in general uh, I remember reading in uh, one of my research that uh, the restrictions, the emergency restrictions for uh, during the COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, during the beginning times, um, you know, there were uh, beach closures, you know, restrictions uh, in hope for hotels and other recreational uh, centers, but uh, which was for a short amount of time. And so do you believe that the emergency restrictions restrictions being removed so early on had uh, played a role in uh, the high mortality rates of COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's funny you, you the person who you ask, right? So some people that were just so tired of being isolated would come to Florida and say, "Oh yes, here I can do anything without a mask." I have friends that visited from up north and they were like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. This sounds like a good thing, but it's not a good thing. Um, because yeah, it, it was all of a sudden, I mean, it should have been something more gradual. Um, 
I mean, I agree with doing that once once the vaccine is fully implemented and you know more people are vaccinated, so you have less risk and all of that. But um, I think it was done in Florida, it was done prematurely. So obviously the hospitals are not ready for what came after that. It was a, it was horrible. It's like if the all of the hospitals were just full of people with COVID and they were not ready for that. So I don't think that was a good idea. I think they should have been obviously more gradual than than just all of a sudden. Okay, now you can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you on thank behalf you. of the Jacksonville Urban League. I want to thank all of you for your presentations and uh, uh, particularly our interns who participated in this and Dr. Alvarez, thank you so much. And I will leave it to Ume since it was your uh, program to let you close us out. All right, uh, like Dennis said, thank you everyone who joined us tonight um, in this really informative uh, presentation. Uh, thank you again to all the interns. You guys all worked really hard on this presentation and we brought some great information. And of course, uh, a big, big thank you to Dr. Anna Alvarez. Thank you so much for blessing us with some wisdom and some insight and giving us some really good perspectives um, about uh, COVID-19. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Great you. Evening. Bye, everyone.